Tropes, for better or worse, are usually a necessary part of storytelling. You'd be hard-pressed to find any story that doesn't use some sort of trope, regardless of the medium it's being told in. Now, for the people who don't know what a trope is, the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary describes it as a common or overused theme or device or a cliché. Some of these clichés would be enemies to lovers, the power of friendship, the main character having a demonic entity inside of them, just to name a few. But among all these tropes, there's one that gets me every time, and it's the focus of this video. This trope is called The Enemy Without. To understand the enemy without, let's go to TV tropes and see what it's described as. When someone's inner darkness doesn't quite take over someone, but it does escape their body and rampage. Fighting someone else's enemy without is tricky, as often it will either kill the person projecting it if it dies, or it will just resurrect itself until the actual darkness in the hero's heart is dealt with by the hero themselves. Often symbolically represents repression and the hero's refusal to acknowledge the darkness within or some sort of aspect of themselves. Victory is achieved half the time via reintegrating with it. The other half of the time it can be seen as representing some inner demon and thus it must be abandoned, purged, or confronted and conquered. Sometimes this battle will occur inside someone's own head in a dreamscape, making it both the enemy within and the enemy without at the same time. It may require saying I'm not afraid of you to weaken it enough to beat it. This approach to the trope is commendable as it fosters a nuanced story storytelling that encourages self-acceptance and personal growth. It emphasizes the notion of harnessing one's inner strengths rather than succumbing to perceived weaknesses. Today, I will delve into three of my most cherished examples, beginning with... The main power system of Bleach revolves around the Zanpakuto, a sword that operates as an extension of the wielder's soul, being the physical manifestation of someone's soul. The closer you are with yourself, the stronger your grasp of your Zanpakuto becomes, as you learn more about yourself through your blade. If someone's instincts is in touch with their Zanpakuto, they are in touch with their soul. Something as simple as knowing your Zanpakuto's name could change the outcome of a battle between you and your opponent. It is key to power your relationship with yourself. This is where Ichigo Kurosaki comes into play, a character so fundamentally at odds with himself and the power he was given at birth that he views it as a curse, and he's trapped in a constant tug of war with himself with his Zanpakuto Zangetsu. I've already made videos more in depth on Ichigo and why I find him fascinating, and I've briefly spoken about this relationship with Zangetsu before, it's just so well done and it's one of Bleach's strongest aspects and embodies this trope to its core. Ichigo's rejection of his darker side, the love for battle. That instinct that had led him to unintentionally suppress himself just like the other characters in this video, allowing himself to be taken by his inner darkness on different occasions. Even when Ichigo defeats this version of himself, it still lingers because the key to overcoming this darkness is to not overcome it at all. And that's the beauty of this trope, to embrace your darker half, use it to your benefit instead of fighting against it, allowing it to control you. Ichigo finally comes to this realization during the Blade is Me section of the story, accepting and realizing that this darkness was never his enemy, it was always there to protect him, a fundamental recontextualization of the story. And with this acceptance of Zangetsu, Ichigo is reforged anew, stronger than ever before, with no more fog clouding his thoughts. Bleach truly is a masterclass with its storytelling and its character, and this being the first time I've encountered this trope. Which brings me to my second example, and it's fitting to come after Bleach, because during my time with this story, all I could think about is Ichigo's relationship with Zangetsu. So let's talk about... Tekken is one of my favorite franchises of all time. It's the only fighting game that I keep up with when it comes to lore. In the sea of convoluted fighting game stories, Tekken is the one that I gravitate towards. It's silly, very tropey, but at times it's shown that it's capable of telling a very serious story when it needs to. And it has a lot of characters that are vastly interesting, and it's the reason why this video was made in the first place. I got done playing Tekken 8 story mode, and it does a lot of things right. One of which, and the topic of this portion of the video, Jin Kazama. Jin has always struggled with a darkness deep inside of him, and it's hindered his life for a long time, leading to many unfortunate events starting as early as 19, as he first unlocks this devil within him as a reflex action after being shot in the head by his own grandfather, Heihachi. 
And ever since that new awakening, Jin has been on the run, not only from his grandfather, but from what lurks within, this constant rejection of the devil within. In his quest to rid himself of the devil gene, Jin cast the world into chaos, leaving death and destruction in his wake to draw it an ancient entity known as Azazel, thinking that defeating him would end the devil gene for good. This is in vain, however. Even though Azazel is defeated, it does not purge Jin of the devil within him, and it leaves Jin continuing down a path of redemption that Tekken 8 tackles. Within Tekken 8, we're given new information that recontextualizes a lot of older events within the Tekken lore, and in a way that makes more sense when looking back on those events, it's revealed that Devil Jin was never trying to harm Jin at all. He wasn't some evil entity hell-bent on destruction like Kazuya. Just like Zangetsu, it was there to help Jin. And looking back at the events of Tekken's past, this is pretty clear. Because every time Devil Jin has emerged in canon, it's always been in self-defense. In Tekken 3, after being shot by Heihachi, in Tekken 4, during the battle with Kazuya and Heihachi, two people who were trying to kill Jin, and in Tekken 5, when Jin Pachi awakens. Which I theorize is the Devil Jin's defense mechanism to the evil spirit that possessed and resurrected Jin Pachi in the first place. Now, Jin does end up being consumed by this power again in Tekken 5 after he's defeated by Haro, another defensive mechanism as he needs to win the tournament to rid himself of the Devil Jin. This information, however, is revealed to us in Tekken 6, but it did take place during the events of Tekken 5. Speaking of Tekken 6, it is the only game where Devil Jin does not make a canon appearance within the store. He would, however, appear in Tekken 7, freeing himself from captivity and killing the soldiers that tried to kill him in Harong. This idea that Devil Jin isn't some malicious entity is further backed up during Jin's arcade ladder ending in Tekken 4, where he flies off, leaving behind one white feather among the black ones. And in Tekken 6, where Jin is arguably his most evil, Devil Jin never makes an appearance. Everything Jin does in the game is by his own hands. Tekken 8 makes Jin confront himself, question his old ideas about the devil within him, and he's able to accept this part of himself and treat it as an ally, allowing him to awaken to a greater power to eventually defeat Kazuya and ultimately save the world in the process. What I do love about Tekken 8 is the way it integrates its story into the gameplay. The confrontation between Jin and Devil Jin in this game transcends both narrative and gameplay. It masterfully weaves storytelling into the very fabric of the experience. Initially, players are led to believe they control Jin only for the camera to swivel and control unexpectedly shifting to Devil Jin during this heated confrontation. This seamless integration is nothing short of phenomenal, leaving a lasting impression. You know what else would be phenomenal? If you subscribe and like the video. I make this kind of analytical content on all things pop culture, and if that's your style, I think this channel is the place for you. And I'd like to get to 20k by the end of the year, and if you want to take that support a step further, consider becoming a channel member or even joining the Patreon. If that's not your thing, you could use my referral link for Boomslang and get 10% off some sweet anime merch. Also, I have a Twitter, so go ahead and give me a follow there if you want to keep in contact with me on a more personal level. And with Tekken out of the way, let's move on to my final example. fan of this series, there's a few characters that dabble with this trope, Terra being one of them, and even Aqua. But for this example, we'll be looking at the series' deuteragonist, Riku. Darkness has been a part of Riku since the very beginning. Unlike Terra, he was somewhat lucky to come to terms with his darkness early on in Rechain of Memories. In the original Kingdom Hearts 1, Riku becomes a vessel for Ansem, letting the darkness in his heart go unchecked as his body is consumed. After Ansem is defeated, Riku regains his body, but the darkness with him does not go away. It is intrinsically a part of his soul. And throughout Rechain of Memories, Riku begins his journey of self-acceptance as he faces off against his demons. This comes to a head by the end of the journey. This offers Riku a choice. Which road would he lead? The one of light or the one of darkness? Riku having finally found himself and probably the first person in the series since Xehanort to have a firm grasp at this point over his darkness says this. Neither suits me. I'm taking the middle road. Do you mean the twilight road to nightfall? No. It's the road to dawn. 
Similar to Ichigo, Riku's journey does not end here. He still grapples with the darkness in his soul throughout 258 over two days and Kingdom Hearts 2 respectively. He's finally able to get a full grasp of his darkness at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2 and during his journey in Dream Drop Distance on his quest to not only become a Keyblade Master but to wake Sora from his sleep. What I like about the storytelling within this example is that not only does Riku's struggle and subsequent mastery of darkness reflect within the narrative but it's also apparent within the gameplay as Riku uses both light and dark attacks moving forward. By the time of Kingdom Hearts 3, Riku is not only a master of the Keyblade but a master of his darkness as well. This trope's brilliance lies within its ability to delve beyond physical conflict, crafting a deeper layer of struggle for its characters. Here, they are engaged in a fierce internal battle, forced to confront hidden truths and grapple with self-doubt and self-loading. The exploration of the enemy within resonates profoundly, reflecting a universal human experience. The journey of self-discovery and the fight against internal demons are beautifully portrayed making this trope a truly moving experience. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say. Maybe in the future I'll do more of these videos discussing tropes that I like and tune in next upload when I discuss Ultimate Spider-Man 2024 and why I think it fundamentally understands Spider-Man as a character better than a lot of media do. This is Grimtoki, this has been Beyond Animation and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.